Our next event is happening in Singapore between the 27th and 28th of February. Now, Founders Longevity Forum Singapore is going to be a unique event brought to you by Founders Forum, the Academy for Healthy Longevity at the National University of Singapore, and of course, Longevity Technology. Now, this event brings together global leaders in clinical, academia, investors, and of course, government. And it's really set to increase knowledge around the whole sector and drive growth, specifically in the Asia-Pacific region, as well as internationally. Now, uh, Tina Woods has uh, uh, been around a long time in this industry, and she's working now with a very new organization, which is very excitingly working in the field of clinics. And I'm delighted to say that she's joining us today. So, hey, Tina, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Phil? Yeah, yeah, I'm great. And of course, you know, you've got your new role as the executive director of the International Institute of Longevity, which mm-hmm. is uh uh, been around a while, right? But I mean, effectively, yeah. your your role is is new. So maybe just explain to us a little bit about what you're doing there. Sure. Yeah, you're right. The International Institute of Longevity has been around for a while. It was set up a few years ago by um, Joanna uh, Bench and and uh, Eric Verdun, and uh, and really have come in uh, fairly recently to kind of reinvigorate and accelerate some of the ambitions of the institute at a time when it's actually really important that we come together as an industry, uh, especially as we're seeing you know a huge amount of interest and uh, investment in the sort of global health and wellness sector and indeed longevity and i see obviously longevity as, as a as a core part of that um bigger sort of pie as it were um and uh, at a time when we need more rigor and uh really best practice and standards and guidelines and protocols to kind of ensure that we're operating as we need to to ensure we're delivering real value to 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 people and not damaging them either because there's quite a lot of new entrants into the space which may not um, be be as robust in their approach as uh, as really as needed. Um, yeah, you know. yeah. Well, I guess it's like every every industry cycle, right? There's a point where um, the early early innovators need to start getting together in a room mm-hmm. and thrashing out standards, so that obviously mm-hmm. you can all compete on the on the same. Uh, base, baseline of rules, right? Which of course yeah. then means that you've got these quality standards, whether it's interoperability or whatever mm-hmm. it may be. And, and of yeah. course, longevity is a very much an international industry. We just completed our our survey, and we had you know countries from all around the world participating. So, being international, I guess that you're now looking at bringing all of these parties together to to work together and mm-hmm. est- establish a process to grow together, right? Absolutely, and you know, and, and what's great to see is that there's a huge there's a huge um, interest and to, to collaborate. I mean, in a sense, you know, c- clinics are all sort of competing in a sense for customers. And of course, clinics are now starting to differentiate themselves in terms of who they're appealing to. And of course, the sort of, sort of services that they're offering. But in the end, you know, there's a finite pool. And I think really the, the aim of the, the Institute is also to grow that marketplace, to really bring it into the mainstream. And that's certainly a lot of the stuff that I've been doing over the past few years is really to bring that science and technology of longevity into the mainstream debate, uh, both, you know, with government, investors, and of course, the general public. Um, so that's, that's really at the heart of this. So I think there's room for everybody. There's plenty of room to grow, it needs to grow. Um, it can't be kind of kept on the fringe, um, yeah. which a lot of people still see it as so there's a lot to be done. So when you when you're talking about um, the concept of policy and regulation, mm. um, of course, if you if you're dealing with human beings, you need to be regulated uh, at the right level, of course, mm-hmm. where, whatever it is that you're doing, yeah. whether it's complementary or you know therapeutic interventions. Do you see that these longevity clinics that are going to be part of your international institute are they going to be the the bridgehead for wider adoption of longevity protocols into you know, deeper public health. Yeah, I mean, I think they, they can have a key role. I think we need more evidence. Uh, I mean, as you know, Phil, I mean, a lot of the interventions that we're seeing and that people are buying, you know, have very little evidence behind them. So uh, and I think, you know, we've reached a point where we've just got to make sure that we're keeping people safe, um, mm-hmm. because I think, uh, you know, the, the real early adopters, the real biohackers, I mean, they may actually be damaging their health with, with some of the stuff that they're doing. So and we're starting to see that. And I think a lot of the, the, the really good clinics, you know, are starting to actually see those patients who are actually doing too much. Um, Um, There's some interesting articles recently about sort of de-prescribing, you know, with um, uh, Andrea Mayer and Evelyn Bischoff, for example, you know, saying really, you know, we've got to kind of keep an eye on this. Um, So I think uh, these are all the sorts of things that we need to to, to sort of look at as a a collective um, grouping of clinics who, who are really, you know, really trying to do their best for in the end to deliver the best 
best possible um, health, um, at, at, you know, and, and value for money really for for people. So, um, and I think you know what we saw, we we sort of have done some initial survey work with some of the clinics that we'll be working with, you know, of, of really where they see are the need, and 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 we we're pretty, you know, amazed by really the the, the unanimous consent, the consensus really on the need for international recognized policy and regulation. You know, I mean everything from. You know, I mean, supplements is a bit sort of, you know, it's a bit of a wild west at the moment. And of course, you know, we need more trials for some of the, the interventions uh, to really see what works. And I think, as you know, I mean, it's really at that N equals one level with individuals, you know, who will need a, a multitude of different interventions, you know, uniquely tailored for them uh, that they will keep to. And there's a whole behavioral change challenge as well, as we know. So so these are all the sorts of areas that we're going to be looking at, um, you know, as, as, a, as a collective. And, you know, there's there's so much more research that needs to be done in some of these new areas and what we call the the, the next frontier of longevity, which is yeah. really about, you know, bringing what really drives human health spend resilience and flourishing is what we like to call it, you know, what really drives that. And of course, there's a lot of, lot of um, data being collected. You know, people are obviously within, within the confines of making sure that their clinical records are secure mm-hmm. and private, which obviously, mm-hmm. you know, systems are in place to support that. Yeah. But this, this concept of having all of the data that's available from all of these people around the world, consolidating that into, let's call it, you know, protocols and perhaps anonymized access to data so that actually this interoperability between clinical groups mm-hmm. and data sharing could lead us to a point where we have better evidence to go forward mm-hmm. with, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I kind of see the world, I, I would, I mean, I, I think the big vision of the future is is this whole sort of open science approach to longevity. And I know there's a lot of, a lot of big groups out there already looking at this, of course. I mean, we've yeah. got evolution looking at this and going into exposomic measurement now. So going beyond the sort of the therapeutics and we've got, you know, M42 looking at this, we've got, you know, big sort of public research studies like Our Future Health in the UK, sort of, you know, the largest health study in the world now. Um, yes. So, you know, and again, the intention there, kind of like what we've had, you know, UK Biobank is still still considered the sort of the gold standard, but we need much more. We need to open out those data sets. We need much more around our behavior and you know, what we do in our daily lives. And of course, that's where wearables and all the d- different sort of technologies in our homes, sensors, you know, collecting all this data will actually really start to open up much greater understanding of what's actually really driving our, our health and and really how our, as individuals we're, we're affected by all these external exposures in our life, you know, right even before birth, right through death to, to, to death. I mean, and this is what I call the exposome, you know, what are all those external stresses in our life, the food that we eat, our activity levels, but actually more and more psychological stress and, mm-hmm. you know, and sort of emotional and, 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 and mental health. These are actually really, really starting to be recognized as massively impacting, obviously, our, our, our biology. And so needs much more research and attention. And then things like air pollution. I mean, my goodness, and pl- microplastics. I mean, these are all hugely important on our health. And it's just now that we're really starting to understand this. And this is where, you know, there's only so much individual agency can do with those other factors. And this is where government, you know, do actually have to intervene to create those healthier environments for human flourishing. Um, And this is where, you know, interesting experiments and and projects like NEON, for example, I mean, they see this as a massive opportunity to understand and build, you know, cities around, you know, what really drives human flourishing. So these are all the sort of the big areas that are all part of what we, the future of and the next frontier of longevity that we need to understand. Yeah. So obviously you're coming to Singapore to talk with us about government and policy, and you've been involved in government policy in the UK, Mm -hmm. and you're now doing this as part of your role as the uh, executive director Mm -hmm. of the International Institute. So Do you see the, the likes of what we've seen in Abu Dhabi with uh, a first push mm-hmm. from a government to actually standardize yeah. and license clinics in, in that particular mm-hmm. territory and, and the wider GCC? Do you see that this is going to be something that's going to accelerate in 2025? I, I think I, I think that's a really I mean, I, I think we, we all need to look at um, what is what is being done and how it how it was done, actually, in Abu Dhabi. I mean, I think, you know, they're they're an example of where they're 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 You know, they've been they've been first uh, in the sense that they recognize the need for this. I mean, they also have the advantage that in a sense they're kind of coming at 
coming at it, they have the, 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 the possibility of sort of creating a whole approach to health in a way that's not encumbered by all the sort of issues that we have in, in what I call, you know, the westernized model of sick care, where we've got, you know, legacy systems, we've got a way of doing things, we've got a lot of entrenched interests, you know, perverse incentives that are locking progress, locking down progress. So I think, you know, um, examples of what we're seeing in Abu Dhabi and elsewhere will hopefully inject a little bit of FOMO, you know, the fear of missing out, like, yeah. actually, you know, they're, they're, they're actually steamrolling ahead they're looking at this from a much more preventative health i mean i'm interested in kind of moving the system change approach to moving sick care to a much more preventative health paradigm and so it's, it's examples like that that will show us you know this is what is possible and actually you know from a health and economic perspective makes a lot more sense far better to treat disease before it starts happening than wait too late as we often do in the westernized model and then of course you know, you're picking up the pieces and it's often too late or not necessarily too late, but it's just further down the line where it's much more difficult and much more expensive to do, to, to, to do this. So really, it is in all of our interests around the world to move upstream into health prevention. And this is where the, the, the science and technology of longevity has so much to offer. And this is the big this is a big, big opportunity and get that into public health, get that into government, um, uh, the government agenda. And this is, again, where regulation and, and policy and and so forth are so, so crucial here. So when you come and join us in Singapore, obviously, this is going to be one of the, the core themes that you'll be pursuing when you're giving us your talk, of course, but likewise, the fact that Singapore's very progressed as a government itself, mm. looking at this space. Do you see that really as part of your role that you'll be using Singapore as a way of bringing some of these parties together as well? Absolutely. Like, I, I think, you know, I mean, Singapore is already often cited as the sort of the, the model to look at. I mean, they're very first to recognize, you know, the impact of the aging demographic on the society. And, and, and more than that, they've started to actually address it with policy. And I think they've had the advantage where they've they've had it, you know, at a very high level in government. So they've been able to make decisions very, very quickly. Um, you know, they have a slightly different culture, of course. You know, there are other cultures that are slightly more difficult in, in terms of just the way things are set up societally. And, and again, it comes down to all the sort of the interest groups and the perverse incentives that are making things much more difficult. So they've had an advantage. They've been able to be much more agile, much more fast footed in all of this. But now they're seeing the results of this. And I, I, and I love all that. I mean, I think some of the policies that they've been, been doing, like recognizing that, you know, as people get older, Keep them healthier for longer so they can be active participants for much longer, keep them and work for longer, often, you know, high quality work, you know, that gives, you know, gives people, you know, the, um, you know, the, 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 the impetus and the sort of the motivation to keep going as well if they love their work. And of course, if they're active and producers in, in the economy, these all add to uh, this, this all adds to the, 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 the opportunity and the, and the dividend, you know, that society gets from this. So, so Singapore, you know, they, they, they are a model for the rest of the world to, to emulate. They've recognized that young people have, you know, given incentives to live closer to their parents and their grandparents, you know, the family unit is kept in, in touch, you know, as communities, you know, uh, so they, again, sort of recognizing that people do better when they're supported by their communities and their families. So these are all the sorts of things that are really, really important to bring into the debate. Yeah, so there's some joining up that needs to be done, of course, from these, let's say, high end uh, clinics that are dealing with people that have got the disposable income to be able mm -hmm. to afford these services and maybe yeah. some of the interventions that come out of that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, the wider society of everybody through through those demographic layers. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were to fast forward in your in your role to to this time next year, right, the end of 2025, mm -hmm. what would be the, some of the objectives that you're looking to achieve in the, in this following year? So what I would really like to see, I mean, I'm, I've, and, and you know me uh, well enough, Phil, to know that I'm very, very much driven by, um, you know, making sure that we, we uh, the, the, uh, the, the access to this technology and science is made available to as many people as possible. So that whole democratization. Democratization, democratization aspect of this is really, really important. Yeah. So, um, so I think if we get more evidence, you know, from trials that show, and of course, yes, there's going to be a certain demographic initially with some of the clinics um, and so forth. But once we start getting the evidence of actually what is really working in this new frontier, and then we, when we start to open up, you know, um, data sets and we start to expand, you know, these trials into other areas. And of course, you know, countries like India and China and, and, and these are all the clinics that we're speaking to. Once you start doing that and you start getting more evidence, that's when the policymakers, that's when government will start to look at this more seriously. It's, you know, that case, that case for prevention and intervening earlier and actually keeping people healthier for longer. Then that's when that's when you can really start to talk mainstream stuff and you start looking at population and public health um, 
aspects to this. But I also think already we're seeing clinics, you know, not necessarily offering the sort of the top end service, you know, for the, the, the high paying customer. You know, I've been speaking to clinics who really are positioning themselves as the Hyundai of, of you know, of, of, of clinics and those who are interested and, 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 and clinics like, you know, like Joanna's clinic, you know, they're, 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 they're pitched at a price level that are, that are below a lot of what the other clinics are offering. So I think there's going to be a lot of differentiation clinics to be able to offer, you know, products and services at low cost cost at lower yep. cost um, and I think you know we're going to see where the real impact of some of these interventions interventions are and, and many of these interventions are actually low cost and that's what we're finding from the so-called so-called blue zone debate going back to basics you know the real basics of prevention that's what most clinics you know will be offering as a baseline you know add it to, add it to, you know all the, the more fancy stuff but actually it's actually fairly low cost, a lot is in interventions, and we have to remember that. And that's where you can really drive impact, you know, across all socioeconomic groups. Yeah. And of course, part of that is spending time with your friends and family, right? So oh, a, 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 a different hat or maybe a different pair of sparkly glasses, you're, you're pushing longevity rave around the world. So how's that going? <laughs> well, I, I've been absolutely overwhelmed by the interest in longevity rave but i think it's it's caught a nerve there's a there's a zeitgeist uh, uh, sort of moment here because really what longevity rave is all about it is about bringing people together about bringing the generations together because we often have a very siloed way of seeing it aging and and I think the plus 50s are actually the most ageist of us all because young people let me tell you um, they do not um, see age in the same way that we do and uh, and I think that's a really important message and actually when young people see older people out at raves they think oh gosh it's not all doom and gloom when you hit your 50s and 60s because I never get that um, from any of the raving that I do right. and certainly with longevity rave the message is we need joy and happiness in our lives and dance. And we're seeing even with music and the healing power of music, I often call it music as medicine, you know, movement, dance, bringing people together, that joy. I mean, that is so important in life. And we are so motivated, much more motivated by the joy of living than the fear of dying. And that was a message from this conference that took place at the Buck Institute hosted by the International Institute of Longevity, as you know, the round table yep. the clinics. That was a key message of the conference by Dean Ornish, who said it really, really beautifully. And Eric Redan said, you know what, it's it's actually become, we're, we are now seeing a health movement come out, you know, globally, and it's actually really hip and cool to be healthy. And look at those those young people of today. They're they're the ones drinking less alcohol. They're the ones turning vegan. And, you know, we've got a lot, of, lot to learn from the younger populations as well. So we all need to come together, bring the generations together and joy and happiness and doing what you love is is a really important ingredient for staying healthy for a very, very long time. Yeah, 100%. Well, Tina, uh, looking forward to seeing you in Singapore. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you.